talking about spraying, it's a lot more than just putting product in the tank and water and going out. You need to have an understanding of a lot of things. Uh, we talk about the four P's, so understanding the pests or the target or the organism that you, you, you're going after. The product, understanding the product you're using and how it works. Uh, the placement, where you're going to get it, generally how you're going to spray it, how much water. And then the procedure, which we'll, we'll go through today, which is the crux of this. So what are we going to do with that? Why do we put so much energy into you know, talking about this application? Well, we want to get the full potential out of our equipment. The products we spend quite a bit of money on, some of them. And we also want to make sure what we're doing is working effectively. We're not wasting that product. We're not getting poor results. Uh, we're not damaging non-target organisms. Um, so there's a lot of good reasons. Stewardship, best environmental outcomes. So we don't want to be going out there and spraying more often than we, we have to. It's not something that we get up in the morning and go, I want to spray. So uh, it's very important to do it correctly. These are some of the situations that can happen that you might have seen on a local oval when things aren't quite right. Uh, top left you've got some uh, different nozzles that are put into a spray cart and you're getting you know, some over application, under application. Here on the right you've got some block nozzles in, a, in an application to clean up some uh, winter grass on an oval. You can see some of it's worked and some of it ha hasn't. And also bottom left uh, on a bowling green, they've been using a probably a fungicide, a DMI type fungicide that affects growth. And because they're walking it, they've slowed down before the end of the run and they've got a lot more growth control or regulation in that area. So uh, there's a lot of things that can go wrong. So we'll start off with the pest, understanding the pest. Uh, this is an example with some insects. Um, Good contrast here, top right you've got mites. I'm not sure if you get mite problems up here at Cyprus, but they live up in the leaf sheath right in the top of the plant. So you need to apply a product to that area. You need to get as much contact with the leaf. Uh, if you're putting it on with a droplet or water volume that's ending up down in the soil, you're wasting your product. So and mites have a lot of life cycles so they can easily build up resistance so you need to really get it where you want. Um, the alternative is your white grubs, your black beetle larvae, your Argentine scarabs that are down in the soil. You need to get, get your product to the soil and past the plant. You don't want it caught up in the plant so you need different nozzles and water volumes. So understanding your pests is important. Uh, this is a look at Fungal pathogens might break out in the plant. Typically when you see something on the green, you say, Craig, got some damage on this green, looks like a disease. This is sort of the area of the disease pathogen life cycle you're, you're observing. By that time, it's already done its damage. It's sending out spores and reproducing. So you might already suffered a lot of damage. So understanding, once again, what's acceptable, whether you're gonna go preventative or curative. So we look at the products. Um, there's a lot of information on these labels, but they are very important. Uh, the first thing you see on the, on the, the front of a label um, at the top will typically be the signal heading. Uh, on, on the left, you can see Barricade doesn't have a signal heading. That means it's unscheduled. Whereas on the right, Meridian's got a caution. So you've got unscheduled, Caution, poison, dangerous poison. And that's your four ratings of uh, their safety risk, I suppose, when, when being used. So um, that's the first thing you see on the label. Uh, under the name, then you have this grouping. You group D herbicide, you group 4A insecticide. And that's very important because that's what we use to rotate our products to try and minimise any resistance from pathogens or insects or so on, which I'll talk about a bit more. So a couple of very key points there. You've got your, your suitable situations, the pests it works against, um, some critical comments, mixing, application, spray timing. So there's a lot of information on there. Um, it's illegally you have to read these labels if you're applying the product and uh, if you're using it regularly, you'll become familiar with it and there's certainly those critical parts of the label that'll really help you out with your application to make sure 
you're getting the best out of the product. So then we go on to formulation. Um, not all products are created equal. Um, not all products with the same active ingredient in them are equal either. So there's different in the manufacturing of the active, but there's also a lot of science and research, research goes into the other products that are in that bottle. Uh, the active ingredient might be, you know, 1% of what's in there, and the rest of it's just not water. You know, it's got to, uh, you know, not freeze, it can't settle, it can't uh, go out of solution, and there's a lot of, a lot of uh, work goes into getting the best out of these products. And um, the similar active ingredient with different, different brands of products can have very different um, add additives in that um, bottle. So oils ain't oils, I suppose you could say. Um, different formulations, micro emulsions, ECs, water dispersible granules, we have some of those now. Uh, Casper's a water dispersible granule. Um, so there is uh, a, a difference in when you can add those to your tank. So if you're going out, typically on a golf course, you might be using some fertiliser or fungicide. Uh, you might even be putting Primo Max in there as well. So you're mixing a few different products and you need to understand what the formulation is to uh, minimise any separation or reaction in that tank. So product movement. So there's two modes of action we'll talk about today. One is physical and one is biological. And when we looked at the grouping on the labels that we use to rotate for minimising resistance, that's the biological. This is the physical. So this is just how the product sort of moves. So typically we've got um, three modes of physical movement. Uh, we talk about contact, so that basically just works on the contact with the insect or the plant. Dac on a weather sticks, typical contact fungicide. So it just goes on to the part of the plant you've applied it to, and then it coats it and stays there till it washes or wears away. And then you've got translamina, where it moves into the plant where you apply it, uh, like the lister. Uh, you put it onto the leaf and the crown, it'll go into the plant and protect that for a certain amount of time, it stays in there. Um, systemic products move in and through the plant, uh, like a Heritage Max or a Banner Max, they'll go in and move up through the plant. So from wherever, wherever you apply them, they'll go in and move up. These are all your DMI Group 3 fungicides. Down the left, you've basically got contacts, so they don't really move from where they're applied. And up the top right, you've got products that just go through the plant in a couple of days. Benamax is sort of in the middle there, and that's what makes it a good curative because it goes through the plant in sort of 14 days and cleans it out. Now, this is the biological mode of action that we talk about, uh, managing resistance. But basically, there's an international committee that groups all these products. So you've got your insect, insecticide resistant action committee, your herbicide, and your fungicide. And what they do is they'll look at how that active ingredient works on that organism and all those actives that work on that organism in the same way, attach or work on it in the same method, are grouped together. And then you've got to try and rotate. So this committee is set up to try and help us manage resistance and try and keep products effective. If you're uh, looking for turf products, there's over 200 products out there you can buy for registered turf fungicides, but we've only got 14 modes of action to actually work with. So, you know, you might have 10 products on the shelf, but they might be the same thing. So you've got to be very aware of that. There's really two groups that we've relied on very heavily for the last 20 years, and I've talked about them a bit. The Stroblins, Group 11, and the DMIs, Group 3. And they cover, you know, six, seven, eight diseases, but they're used a hell of a lot, and there's not much rotation. Um, we've got a new product, fairly new, Velista, which I mentioned, and that falls into Group 7 there, and it's a broad spectrum. So it's, it's given some more flexibility for people to rotate between those three, but it's very important to um, manage these well. You can see here on the right, it's got your risk of resistance, and these, these go-to products are in sort of moderate to high range, so it's very important 
that we manage them. Now this is just a bit of an idea of how if you were going to rotate your fungicide groupings uh, with our products that you'd look at it. So I've got Ballista, you've got a group 7, then you go to a 3, then to an 11, back to a 7. So it's just giving you some idea if you're building a program over summer for disease, uh, how to rotate those products to try and get two applications in between before you go back to that same, same chemical group. So on to mixing additives, getting the best out of our products. I've all heard of uh, surfactants, adjuvants, things that we add to the tank to help the effectiveness of the application. Uh, Non-ionic surfactants is a very typical one that we have on some of our labels and they basically help the surface contact. They break down that surface tension on the leaf or whether it be the insect and get more product, more of that spray solution that you're putting out to, to contact the target. pH is very important uh, with your tank mix, particularly what goes in your tank. So if you can't have access to town water or a good water quality to mix in your spray tank, uh, and you're using dam water or bore water, uh, you, you could have some issues. So it's important to know the pH of that tank mix and the water that goes in it. That's a list of a few products that can get iffy. I've got some here that up in uh, 8, 9 pH, uh, you know, you'll lose effectiveness and also some when you're down as low as 3 or 4. So as long as you're in the sort of 6 or 7 range, you're pretty good. But if you like a lot of golf courses, you'll add fertilizers into your mix. Things like sulfate of iron can acidify your tank mix and then all of a sudden you're getting down into that sort of 4 pH, so it can be a bit iffy. So a good thing to keep uh, an eye on. Uh, water hardness, um, if you've got a lot of minerals in your water using bore water, that's, that's something you've got to look into in a bit more depth because they can tie up some of your products completely, like uh, herbicides, and basically render them ineffective in the tank. Okay, on to placement. So water volume determines where it's going to end up and then your droplet size is what it's going to cover on the way, on the way through. So this is an example of a trial. It was an application for um, dollar spot. On the top you've got a control that wasn't sprayed that's covered in dollar spot. Bottom right you've got your 450 litre application which obviously was leaf and crown and on the left a thousand litres per hectare. So just that increased water volume, a lot of the products gone past the leaf and crown where you wanted it and you've got a lot more disease. So a simple thing like that can render it sort of 50% effectiveness. Uh, another look at uh, where you want to get your product. So on the left you've, you've applied a product probably like 200 litres per hectare, you're just getting it on the top of the leaf um, that's suitable for a true systemic, like a monument that's going to move down into the plant or a signature extra that's going to move down. But anything else, like if you put a, a banner max or a heritage on there, it only moves in and up. So you're only actually protecting the top bit of the leaf you contacted. The rest of the plant is not being protected. So it's really important to the combination of the product and the way it moves and how you apply it to get the best out of it. The middle one, you've got good leaf and crown contact, so that's typically your leaf and crown diseases, dollar spot, um, you know, pythium blight. And then on the right, you've got you know, more water volume, a bigger droplet to get it past the leaf and into the soil where you need it, say like a barricade, pre-emergent, uh, ballista for fairy ring. I mean, ballista is used for fairy ring down in the soil but it's also used for leaf and crown diseases, so depending on what you're using it for. But if you put the uh, Velista on the leaf here for fairy ring, and then you water it in later, some of the product's gonna already be moved into the plant because it gets taken into the plant. So you gotta put your bigger nozzles on, get your increased water volume, get it down into the soil, and uh, you'll get the best result. Um, they did research and testing with the nozzles on the market and found you know, they weren't perfect for turf. So these nozzles actually spray at a, a wider angle than a standard nozzle and they cover the 
the uniformity you lose when you go over undulations on a golf course. So between 300 and 700 mils, you're still getting good uniformity if your height varies. Uh, they also uh, spray at a slight angle. They don't spray straight down to the ground. And they found with the standard nozzles, when you're driving over turf, you get a, a different ratio of application on either side of the turf plant on the leaf. So they sample the leaf and they look at the coverage they were getting and they found by trial and error, if they angle that, that application slightly backwards, you'll get a closer to 50-50 coverage on the turf leaf on the ground. And they're also uh, just got the, the right amount of air induction. So air induction's basically you get air into the droplet to give you bigger droplets less impacted by spray drift and then as it hits the surface it explodes and gives you that coverage. So procedure, we talked about your different uh, formulations and the order to mix them in. Your spray contract calculations, so before you go out you've selected your product, it's going to be applied, the best product for, for what your issue is. You've looked at the rate of application on the label, there might be a variation. Um, the recommended water volume, so like I said with Velista, depending on what disease you're chasing, you might have different water volumes and different nozzles. Um, irrigation required before and after application. So some herbicides are actually, you know, can knock your plant around a bit. So there's, there's a fine line of getting them on, not getting any phytotoxicity or any discoloration. So sometimes if you're spraying on greens or fairways that are a bit stressed or a bit uh, dry, you can get a negative effect. So sometimes in understanding your irrigation before application is just as important as after to prepare the plant so it's in the best possible condition. Uh, do you need a tank buffer if your pH is out in your spray tank? You may need to buffer it to get it to where you want it before you mix your product and the surfactant we we've already talked about. So some tips before we go out and uh, run through this. Spill kits, uh, I'm sure Craig's talked to you about. If something goes wrong, you've got to have your spill kit handy. Tire pressure should always be right because that will, that, will that will vary your application rate. Uh, if you've got XC nozzles, our nozzles, just remember they only point in one direction. There's a little notch on them to put to the front. Uh, no leaks under high pressure, so you might you know, bump the pressure of your spray up when you're running some water through it just to make sure there's no leaks before you drop it down to operating pressure. Pressure equal in all the booms, so you've got multiple booms and there's devices on the equipment for when you shut one or two of those booms down to keep that pressure level. Um, and we need to keep an eye on them because that can, uh, you can shut a couple of booms off and your pressure might go up by quite a lot, typically on the older spray equipment. Uh, nozzle pattern is correct, so that's a visual check. Uh, check your records of what was used last. So Craig might have sent someone out to spray some, some uh, power on fairways last week and the guy that was cleaning it up, I don't know, might have had an you know, emergency call and had to go home, he couldn't clean up the equipment correctly and you're going out to spray greens this morning, you see something funny in the tank. So you might have had a product in there that's gonna kill the greens. So being aware of what went out last time, making sure you keep your eye out that the, the gear's clean. If you see anything unusual, contact him and say, what was used last? Because trust me, I've killed some grass just for those reasons, you know, product, a bit of residual in the tank. Sometimes it'll only take a tiny amount but it can uh, really kill some grass. Uh, booms level, particularly if you're not using our nozzles because they really rely on the accuracy of that 500 mils. Fuel tank's full, pressure gauge needle is steady. Some of the old equipment's got a dampener on the spray tanks because they're single piston pumps and you can get, if it's, if it's not set right, you can get a, like a pulsing. You can actually see in the spray jets, uh, which varies your application. Filters are clean uh, and your nozzles are uniform and that's something we'll do out there. We'll, we'll run a, a flow test across the boom and check that the nozzles are all fairly uniform because if they're two years old and you've got a bit of wear, you might have too much variation, it might be time to replace them.